Good morning, church. How are you doing today? Welcome to Joy Church. You're free to stand to your feet. It's a great day to be in the house of our God. It's an amazing day to be in His presence, to come and worship Him. We'd love to invite you to sing and to worship. We love you, Lord. We welcome you today. Now the darkness fades into new beginnings as we lift our eyes to a hope beyond. Good morning and welcome to Joy Church. We're so glad you're here this morning. If you have children and you've yet to check your children into their classes, you still have time to do so. You can check them in at the Connect Center out in the foyer. If you'll be joining Growth Track today, we're in week one. There's refreshments provided and you are dismissed at this time. If you go out into the foyer, there's a host that help you find your way, but you don't want to miss Growth Track. It is your next best step. We're going to be continuing on in our time of worship. And I just want to remind you that God's word says in James chapter 4, verse 8, that those that draw near to God, he will draw near to them. So as we worship, I want to encourage you, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Let's worship.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. There's power that can break off every chain. And there's power that can empty out a grave. And there's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. There's power in your name. Can we sing that one last time this morning? There's power. There's power that can break off every chain. And there's power that can empty out a grave. Oh, there's resurrection power that can save.
one more time. I just sense right now that some people in this room, maybe you came in with difficult circumstances. Maybe there's some things in life they don't look good. But the Bible tells us that He works all things together for the good of those who love Him and who are called according to His purpose. Maybe this morning you came into some things that don't look good on the outside. I can make you a promise. God's working. It's not over yet. If you just need some fresh hope in your heart, could you lift your hands right now? We're going to sing this. The Bible promises that God's goodness, His mercy, His loving kindness is running after you. That even when life is difficult, even in the midst of trials and tribulations, God's goodness is there for you. And we're going to declare this this morning, that your goodness, God, it's running after me. Even in difficulty, it's running. You ready to sing that out this morning? God, your goodness, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after. God, every single one of us, my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything, it's your goodness is running after. Church, the band is going to lead us in singing this one more time. But I believe there's some people in this place this morning that you don't know that you're a child of God. And I believe that you need to hear today that you are a child of God. You are called by God. God is calling your name. And even more than that, His goodness is for you. His goodness is after you. And you look at your life and you say, how could his goodness be after me? His goodness doesn't depend on your circumstances. His goodness has nothing to do with what you've done in the past. His goodness is for you here and now. Let's sing this again. God's goodness. God, we thank you that your goodness is after us. God, we can't run from your goodness. We can't hide from your goodness. Your goodness is after us, God. You love us so much. You desire to pour your goodness, your blessing upon us. And God, we thank you for that. God, we worship you. We glorify you. We love you so much. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Joy Church. We're so glad that you're here today as you make your way to your seat. If this is your first time, we want to say welcome to Joy Church. We are one big family, and there is a place for you. If you don't belong to a church, we want you to come back. Um, we hope you will join our family. As I said, there's a place for you, and we're so excited that you are here this morning. If you are planning on joining, attending Growth Track, and you missed the first dismissal, you still have time. You can, you can go now. You're dismissed. Do You don't want to miss Growth Track. It is your next best step. Also, if it was your first time, we want to remind you that we have some welcome cards in the pew in front of you. You can fill one of those out and turn it in on your way out. We want to connect with you and help you feel a part of this family. But if we could have our ushers and our offering team come forward, we're going to have an opportunity to tithe and to give into God's house this morning. Uh, but I, first, I'd like to read a portion of scripture, and it's found in Luke chapter 13, and it's verses 10 through 13. You can follow along on the screen. It says this, one Sabbath day, as Jesus was teaching in a synagogue, he saw a woman who had been crippled by an evil spirit. She had been bent double for 18 years and was unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Dear woman, you are healed of your sickness. Then he touched her, and instantly she could stand straight. How she praised God. 
wow, this is the incredible healing power of Jesus. And you know, we at Joy Church are in a series called Free, and this series is all about the healing and freeing power of Jesus. But you know what? The reality of Joy Church is that week after week, we seek to bring people to the freeing, healing power of Jesus. So this morning, as you give, as you tithe, I want to remind you that you're partnering with the freeing, healing power of Jesus that happens here week after week in our services. Let's pray. God, we come before you, and we thank you that you partner with us. God, you choose to use us to bring freedom and healing to your people. So God, we pray you bless every person as they give, as they tithe. God, and we just ask that people will be free today and every day as we work and we seek to bring people to your presence. God, we pray you be glorified today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Go ahead, ushers. Good morning and welcome to Joy Church. If you're new to Joy Church and we haven't had the opportunity to meet you yet, we would love to meet you and your whole family out at our Connect Center in the main foyer directly following service. If you don't have a chance to stop by there, right in the seat in front of you is a little card that says welcome home on it. If you don't mind filling it out for us, you can drop it in the offering bucket as it goes by or turn it in at the Connect Center and receive a free gift. We can't wait to meet you and your family. No matter how long you've been coming to Joy Church, Growth Track is your very best next step. Growth Track is the perfect way to find out all about who we are here at Joy Church and how you can be a part. It happens every week during our 11 a.m. service in our Junior High Center with refreshments provided. We'd love to see you for Growth Track today. This week is week one of Growth Track where we're gonna focus on how you can become a member here at Joy Church, where you can find out all about who we are here at Joy Church and how you can be a part. We'd love to see you today. Encounter Retreat is coming up at the end of May and it's going to be happening Friday and Saturday, May 31st and June 1st here at Joy Church. It's going to be an incredible weekend of encountering Jesus. And so if you've never been through an Encounter Retreat, we would love to invite you to sign up for Encounter at our Connect Center and join us this year for our Encounter Weekend. We'd love to see you there. Next Sunday, May 12th, is Mother's Day, and we are so excited to celebrate moms here at Joy Church. We would love for you to join us next week as we celebrate Mother's Day. There's going to be a free gift for all of the moms, so don't forget, bring your mom or come with your family next week. We would love to see you as we celebrate Mother's Day here at Joy Church. Some of you may not know this, but we have an incredible Bible college and internship program here at Joy Church called Zoe Interns. And Zoe Interns is gonna be having a preview day on Thursday, May 16th from 9 a.m. to 1. There's gonna be lunch included, tons of games and snacks and fun things you are not gonna to wanna to miss. So if you are high school and older and maybe looking for what God has for you in your college years, we would love for you to join us for our Zoe preview day on May 16th. We hope to see you there. Young adults, coming up on Sunday, May 19th, we're gonna be taking over the Southgate Center where there's Mod Pizza, Chipotle, and Five Guys Burgers for a young adult lunch at 1 p.m. So we'd love for you to join us, mark your calendars, and come out for our young adult lunch on the 19th. Have a bad one then. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great day to go get your giant burrito. I'm already scheming at Torta Loca, the big double maxo that that van gets, you know, well, however big it is. But anyway, I asked Johnny if he'd just sing a, like a, a, a chorus in Spanish just to honor all of our, our uh, Mexicano friends. Uh, Cinco de Mayo was uh, literally, we've stayed uh, in a hotel called the Listra in, uh, in Puebla, but the actual uh, 5th of May is not Mexican national independence. It's, it was a victory over the French at a, at a fort in Puebla. And what had happened was that uh, the Mexicans had tunnels that went clear down into the city. And so they kept supplying uh, their, their troops, new troops and, 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 and munitions and just wore the French out. And so that's, that's what we're celebrating or tacos or just the fact that we love all of our Hispanic friends and specifically in this case, honoring Cinco de Mayo, which is Mexicans. My brother-in-law Benigno told me to say all this. So that's, anyway. Queremos cantar una canción en español para celebrar el 5 de mayo. Gracias, Cristo. Oh 
Thank you, gracias, Johnny, para todo sus cosas. <laughs> all right. You people are all getting along. What's wrong with you people over here? There's some reason that these people don't want to sit with you people. Oh, I see. It's the Schmelzer clan back there. Okay. That's understandable. Wow. Uh, Johnny got in and, and uh, Zach and George got in about 3.30 last night. They were doing a, a youth retreat up in, in Malala. And then they had, I think, last night they had a, a big rally. And uh, about 100 kids got saved last night. So, <laughs> so without being really prophetic, I, I see a nap in their future this afternoon. <laughs> And I've started many naps with my preaching. It's a, I have a gift to uh, people with insomnia get healed here. And uh, <clears throat> I want to talk about vacation, about a vacation that was just great. But first of all, just to let you know that 17 of us right now are in Ireland. And uh, we have the uh, interns, the Zoe interns, and then different ones from the church are in Ireland right now having a great time. And uh, in Ireland, if you can see blue sky and sunshine, it's a good day. It's a great day. And yesterday, the team, uh, they'd been painting and evangelizing and all this. And they went to the Cliffs of Moher, if you've ever watched the movie um, Leap Year. Uh, when the guy and the gal fall in love, it's right at the Cliffs of Moher. It's just absolutely beautiful. It looks like the Cliffs of Dover in England. And, uh, and so they got to visit there, and they sent photos, and it was just Beautiful blue, but they all were still wearing <laughs> wraps and coats, so it was still Ireland. Blue sky, windy, better wear a coat, better wear a jacket, but it's beautiful country there. So they're having a great time, and then the uh, 15 of them will be back with us on Tuesday, and two of them are escaping to France and London for a while. So, so let's just stay home, okay? Let's not try to go. <laughs> Well, one year, Kim and I, when the kids were all still at home, Jake was probably 16, um, we decided to spend a month in the summer camping at Howard Prairie Lake. And so what we were doing, we'd, we pulled up a travel trailer, and so we pulled it right next to the lake side, and, and then we'd come back and do Wednesday night service and Sunday service. But we were primarily, during the weeks, we were up, up at the lake, and it was fantastic. I mean, literally, have you ever had those, those holidays or vacations that it's really working for you? And, and this was, we had, a, we had a, a raft with a motor on it, and, uh, and uh, so we, we would do a little bit of fishing, but it wasn't primarily fishing, we'd do swimming, and, uh, and then uh, I had made these crawfish traps, three of them, and we were catching about 100 crawfish a night. 
So, so I, we would, the kids and I, we'd go and we'd take and get fish heads from the fishermen and, and uh, whatever, body parts, you know, from when the mafia executed somebody. We'd just put that in there. Uh, anything that the crawfish would eat. And uh, so we, then we'd drive it out and I'd made this and you, you create the crawfish trap and then you have to know where it's at. So you tie, you know, rope to a floating tube, like a bleach bottle or milk jug and stuff. So, so we'd have our traps out, three of them, and, and we were harvesting about 100 a night. And then this is the joy of being married to a half Sicilian girl. We were taking that and making pasta and it was like heaven. Great vacation, having a great time until dot, dot, dot. You ever had the great time until dot, dot, dot? Like one guy said, I didn't mind falling out of that 10th floor. It was when I hit the bottom that it got, it got to be a bummer. And uh, all of a sudden, um, I began to have a spiky fever, like the worst flu symptoms that you'd have. Have, have you ever been chilled? Like one of the worst chills that you can get in my estimation is go to the beach, get a sunburn, and then try to watch fireworks at night because that sunburn turns into like a fever and a chill and, oh, it's terrible. Well, this was like that. I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm starting to go delirious and, uh, and our friends Terry and Debbie, they were up and they were hanging with us that day. And so finally what happened was... Uh, you know, Terry or someone said, have you had any wounds? Well, I did. So the sub-moral of the story is don't put black electrical tape on cuts. <laughs> so finally, I'm having this fever. I'm laying in the trailer. And the family and the kids and Kim, they're, you know, just doing their best. And wondering if I just have the flu. Well, when we take the tape off my foot... Uh, I hadn't cleaned the wound out. Lakes have bacteria. Okay, press release. Lakes have bacteria in them. Rivers do. Everything does. Not to make you paranoid, but bacteria lurk in water bodies. So when you take a bath, don't save it for the next week. Got that, Johnny? Okay. And uh, so here I am with a wound, and I'm, I'm in the water, and I'm doing this and that, and, and all of a sudden, I have an infection. My good friend, Terry, who's rescued me many times in my life, he's driving me down the hill. I'm shaking. We come into Medford, and the doctor didn't treat me with good bedside manners. He sh shakes his bony finger in my face. Buddy, you're just one step away from being hospitalized. And I said, no, man, what, what can you do without hospitalizing me? My family's having a vacation. I don't want to be sitting in a hospital bed. So they gave me an IV, and I had to come down twice more. Terry would drive me down, and I would get, uh, get my IV filled with uh, penicillin or whatever the uh, antibiotic was. And um, good news is I'm here. I didn't die. Unless you really don't like me, and at which time you think, bummer, we missed it. Anyway, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. How much bacteria do you really need to kill you? Uh, just enough to get started. How many of you know that bad things multiply? So do good things. But like bacterias, multiply. And it, doesn't, it just takes an opportunity to work in your body and that... Your body being the host, the host can be killed by the, the negative infection. I'll give you another free health tip. Please do not disregard problems with your teeth. Okay? I, I'm not like, a, like a, a doctor or anything, but I have stated at a Holiday Inn Express. <laughs> but in case you don't know where your face is and your heart is, they're rather close. <laughs> like for German people, we, you can tell we have a face. You won't find a neck, though. Okay, we have no neck. But uh, you get teeth problems, infections. A number of people have died 
because that infection went right down into the heart. Infections aren't anything to be trifled with. And you're saying, what is this? We're singing Mexican choruses. We're celebrating the Cinco de Mayo. We're talking about, you know, uh, the team being in Ireland. And now you're talking about your vacation gone bad. Okay, that vacation is a number of years ago. But what I'm talking about is God has called us to be free. But we have an infection that's all over our body. How many of you know that you don't, to get an infection that could kill you, you already have it on your body? You say, well, I took a good shower today. That's great. So did I. That doesn't mean that I don't have the potential of infection. Bacteria is all over. So what you have to do is you have to make sure you, you don't just let wounds fester. You don't just leave things undone. You don't let sin flourish in your lifestyle. Saying, well, I, you know, I, somebody told me on YouTube that, you know, I'm just so under grace that there's nothing I can do to cause God to be angry with me. God doesn't need to be angry with you for something to kill you. When I had that, that, that infected foot, going down the hill, one thing that never crossed my mind was if God was trying to kill me. I realized I had provided the stupidity. I had provided the dumb, and it was wise to get treatment. That's wisdom. How many can say, I can provide the dumb, I need God to provide the wise, and then we got wisdom. You, you don't always have to try to kill yourself with sin, to have sin come and bite you, and if you don't tend it, if you don't take the struggle as real seriously as we handled last week, we're in a struggle. We're in a struggle. Well, brother, I'm just walking in the peace of the Lord. That's cool. Go evangelize then. How many of you know that it's a lot easier if you're monastic and you're up on top of a hill and it's you and, your, and, your, and the writings, it's you in the Bible and it's you in the commentaries and it's you just praying alone, maybe occasionally sending a carrier pigeon down the hill. But when you engage real people in real life, you're going to find out the struggle is real. It's real in their life. And even the traffic they'll bring back into your life is real. The struggle is real. And sin is not something that Jesus took lightly. Jesus didn't even take the devil lightly. He always says, when you pray, you pray our kingdom come, but don't you finish your prayer without bringing the devil in it. Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil or the evil one. Every day I wake up, man, I know there's two companies in my room. Some of y'all never have the demons there, which means you're no threat. But I am a threat. And the familiar demons that have trailed me and my family all of my life, they're there. And that innumerable company of angels is there. And the Trinity is there in my room. And I have to set my mind to say, you guys can go on vacation. Your work's done. Sin's not going to have rule in my life. You boys are unemployed. Holy Spirit, Father God, Christ Jesus, and all that's holy, welcome. Let me walk in the Spirit today. Let's, let's dig into this. When I preach this stuff, this is so deep in my, as a warrior, and wanting that everyone that I can touch, I want us to cross the finish line with our hands together. We made it. We made it. That city where the lamb is the light. That city where there's no more night. That city where there's no other crying or tears and sorrow and no more sin. I don't know about you, but until we cross the gates and we're in that city, we're still at risk that that which pulls at us wants to pull us back and take away our destiny, possibly even our life. Before I finish this message, I'm going to talk about three mics. Three young men that were beautiful guys named Mike that their life just turned drastically ugly because of sin. And that sin didn't just compound in spiritual challenges. It compounded in spiritual, physical death while practicing spiritual uh, unfaithfulness. Sin kills. The sinful nature that we battle 
is like bacteria waiting to latch onto us. If we simply submit to sin, the infection, we may find ourselves delirious and possibly dead from it. All I had to do to die, because I was so out of my mind, is just stay in my trailer and shiver until I just lost feeling and they could have taken me. Which Kim thought about that later, realized she made a big mistake sending me down the hill. We're going to look at the tools that God has given to us. That was just a joke. Don't be glaring at my wife. Anyway, we're going to look at the tools that God's given us to free us from any tie to the sinful nature. We're going to read some scriptures. This is from the NIV. We've been working from the NLT, but the NLT is a little bit more brutal in saying your sinful nature. NIV said the sinful nature. And so in light of people have differing views on, 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 on this, I didn't want to say your sinful nature, just saying the one that's offered to you, that you can choose not to take. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death. But the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. But you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. We just sang that. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. But you receive the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we we may also share in his glory. Wow. (laughs) Sometimes I, I, I read the Bible and I would just like to sit down and just go, Selah, think of it, ponder it. Pause, meditate on these things. I, I'm going to talk to you about a haunting that I have. To be haunted means you're preoccupied. Something's just in you and you, you can't shake it. I can't shake the authority of Scripture. And number two, I don't want to. There's a growing trend to what I call bookless Christianity. That's scary. Because the Bible is the canon of Scripture. It's the measuring rod. When, when Jesus came to legally fulfill the role as being the Son of God and the Messiah, it was constantly stated about Jesus. It is written, as it was written, out of Israel, out of Egypt, I have called my Son, as it is written, that a, a great light shines from Galilee, as it is written, by his stripes we are healed, as it is written. When Jesus was going to overcome Satan, he kept saying, to Satan, not Satan, you know, I've got power, you know, Satan, I've got authority, and Satan, I'm all this in a bag of chips. He kept saying, it's written. Amazing that Christians today feel you can be wordless or bookless Christians. So I'm haunted by the Bible. And I want to die as a man that loved the word, stayed in the word, 
and made the word be the model whereby we, we do all things. And so we're going to find that, that sometimes we read and we just go, wow. Well said. Paul's one of the great thinkers Jesus gave all of the building blocks. He, 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 he laid down his own life and, and bought us by his blood. He sent the Holy Spirit. He gave us a moral code that just blew apart the, uh, the work of the, of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Jesus was like David. He gave all the building blocks, but Solomon built the temple. And the Holy Spirit's building the temple, and he uses people like Paul, who's a teacher. And Paul goes in to explain what's behind the scenes. Like some people are happy to be able to say, boy, I got, I've got a brand new Chrysler or I got a brand new Mercedes. They want to drive the car. Other people want to know what's actually behind that. And they go back to the study of molecules and atoms. And, and so it, when it comes to truth, we find that when you read different portions of the Bible, you can come to, okay, we already know this. Sin bad, obedience good. Devil bad, Holy Spirit good. Then all of a sudden you can get bored by someone like Paul that says, no, you need to understand this. That, that even as you're walking in Christ, you still have something pulling at you. And, and, and so it's not just, because I, 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 I've dealt with a lot of pride in people over the years. And, and I know it's not this group currently because I pastored for nearly 40 years here. So it must have been some other place, maybe a different county. Or maybe it's even in us. Spiritual pride. I'm really close to God. I'm watching what I do. I've got this. And so I find that, that some people can be real proud of like, hey, hey. <laughs> Others can betray you, Lord, I'll never betray you. And they find themselves flat on their back. And some people roll into sin and never return. And so I try to speak the best I can to feed the flock of God. That means the hungry, the unhungry. Try to throw salt on you to make you thirsty if you're not. So that we can understand that if we look in the scripture, we can get healthy in the way we think, understanding. So we're going to break down this really quickly. In verse 5, Paul just busts out. He says, those who live according, live according. Everybody's living according to something. And, and the choices are two. You know, like, like the, the Bob Dylan song, you're going to have to serve somebody. It might be the devil, better be the Lord, but you're going to serve somebody. There's not multiple choices here. I'm not serving God. I'm just kind of taking care of me right now. That means you're serving the devil. If you're not serving God, you're always defaulting to the flesh. And so what happens here is every one of us in this room are living according to a mindset we have. And so you are going to live according to either the sinful nature or the, the Holy Spirit, which is God's nature. Say, Sinful or Holy Spirit? Where your mind is set determines the destination and fixes the according. So don't tell me that you're so spiritual, you don't need to use your mind in this walk with God. Get your brain working, guys. Get your brain working. My spirit works. I pray in tongues. I, I, I seek to be filled with the Spirit. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, trying to praise God with worship. But I'll tell you what, there's also something, get your brain on. You're not so Holy Ghost that God's going to go brainless with you. Because this was a Holy Ghost guy. Paul was the one that said, I speak in tongues more than y'all. But where you're going to go is where you're setting your mind, where you're phrenos. Is set. That's why Satan loves to blow people's minds. He loves people to get a wet brain from alcohol. He loves people to overdose on drugs because there's something about the brain that even with spiritual input, it, 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 it goes through various gates to get to us. And one of them is the will gate. It's the, the mind gate. 
I told my kids, don't ever say that we schmelzers don't have sin as an option. Of course we do. That'll, you'll, you'll be taken out if you believe that. You must believe that whether you're a schmelzer or whether you're a Martinez or whether you're an Odom, it doesn't matter. You have got to set your mind on God. Because the McBurglar's coming to take your fries. The McBurglar, that's the devil. Where your mind is set determines your destination and fixes the according. And then the outcomes of these two mindsets. Verse 6 says the mind of sinful man is death. Then it gets some positive about the mind controlled by the spirit. But skipping up to verse 7. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law nor can it do so. Every time I've willfully sinned I've found that even though I was still born again, I've never found that I was wanting to do evil and felt like like really close to the Holy Spirit. How has am I the only one that's ever sinned since you became a believer? Has anyone make sinned one or more times in thank you, like one eighth of the people. The, the rest are Pharisees, and it's good to have you in the service today. I found that. In my life, from the time I stole my cousin's little car at five years old, I knew as a little kid walking home to the house, we lived a block away from my cousin's, I knew I did wrong. And, and believe it or not, in my little five-year-old mind, I was justifying it. I can honestly tell you, Satan has sought to seduce me, but, but, but I've, I've, to my knowledge, every sin I've ever done came through my mindset gate and my will gate. I, I'm not one of these like, like shallow-minded people like, oh, I couldn't resist. No, I chose not to resist. That was grace not to do everything I've ever done wrong. And the outcome is, is, is going to be the mind of sinful man is death. The sinful mind is hostile to God. If you're finding that your thinking is increasingly hostile to God's right to rule in your life, you are, you are eating carnality for breakfast. You've got to turn around. I think I heard, is that Ryan back there, kind of amening? Just, I'm just trying to find where my allies are in the group. How many of you believe that, 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 that a believer can take the initiative to repent and turn your thinking around? So the outcome is death for the sinful man and the sinful mind. And then, then the second half of verse 6 says, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. Wow. Third point, through the Spirit of God, we're no longer controlled by the sinful nature, the flesh, but by the Spirit. But it's got two conditions. The Spirit must live in you. I'm going to say it another way. You know, the Holy Spirit really would love to live in every human. So do you think that by them saying you can't live here, that he dies? He doesn't die. But in terms of you, it's as though he's dead. He doesn't live there. You made it clear. There's no room here. Now, My doctrine of salvation is I believe that when you call on the name of Jesus, you become a lamb, you become a sheep, you become born of God. But I actually believe that you can so willfully disobey God that the the base of your faith can be so eroded that you can end up reprobate and it is as though you never knew God. So I live with a little fear in my life I don't believe that you just kind of do a cursory, I'm sorry, Jesus, maybe get baptized in water and then put it on cruise. Any more than when that infection was in my foot, if I kept it in cruise, I'd have been in a flip-top box. I know one thing, sin must be fought at all times. And so we find here that Paul is saying, hey, but you're not under, you're not controlled by the flesh nature or you are controlled by the Spirit, providing the Spirit lives in you, and he goes to an aside. If the Spirit doesn't live in you, in other words, you're not getting any prompting about evil. You, you, you can get saved into religion, or you can become born again into the kingdom of God. 
Wow, sometimes I just like to sit and listen to me. Because <laughs> it's, it's good. What I'm saying is really good. I, I got blasted into the kingdom of God. And like when I was a little crumb cruncher, like little Wesley, and, I, and my daddy walked with me. I wanted to walk like dad. Now I'm old like dad is, and I even walk like him now. It'd take forever to get in the car. Dad used to load a pipe, and I don't know what my excuses are, but they always tell me, Dad, we got to go to the restaurant before they go out of business. <laughs> when you're born, you want to look like your daddy. You want his respect. You want his love. And when you're born of the living God, there's a desire. I don't want to dump. I'm kind of a caveman that shaves. I'm really old school. You don't betray a friend. You don't do bad to people that do you good. And I felt something in 1971 when my sins rolled away. That I have sinned and it breaks my heart every thought of every time I've willfully turned away and done something on my own. But I say, Lord, it's you and the bones that you've broken. You are justified. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And Paul is saying this. He's saying, hey, you're free from the obligation to follow the flesh and try to pay your way into righteousness through the Spirit of God. But providing that you're in the Spirit, and if you don't have the Spirit, you're not of His. We can all take a look at our life and look in the mirror. One guy, I told him, I said, you'll know you're a Christian not because that you look at your column of all your perfections, but because you'll look at your sin and you're broken. He told me that was the greatest counsel he'd ever heard that allowed him to continue to grow as we realized that there's something when you're born of God, you just aren't excited about filth and compromise. Being born again by a holy God does not make you want to just, hey, let's see how sleazy I can get because I'm under grace. No, True grace doesn't lead to disgrace. It leads to honor and glory. And so we have the spiritual realities of Christ is in you, verses 10 and 11. Your body is dead. It's doomed. How do you know if you have a sin nature? Look at your body. Is it aging? If sin nature was completely out of, out of your body and out of your world, you wouldn't even age. The very fact that we are marching to a grave is an indicator that there's a flesh nature that we also have to battle. That doesn't take away that we are made brand new in Jesus Christ. It doesn't take away the spiritual reality that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. But watch this. There's two realities. You were born under Adam. You are born under Christ. And while you have the flesh, that's still an Adamic reminder. And so you've got to set your mind on God. The spiritual realities of Christ is in you. Your body is dead. Or it's, it's doomed because of sin. Yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. Say, my spirit is alive because of righteousness. Not my own, but Christ that he freely shares. The second reality is he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. This is the covenant of divine healing while we live. How many of you know you need your earth suit repaired from time to time? Thank God for the times that I've been divinely healed without doctors. Thank God for doctors that help me get divinely healed with their help. How many of you know we hate sickness? We don't want you to die. Ask Jesus what therapy he wants. Don't feel guilty if you feel that you're to have a surgery. We'll be there to pray with you. And we still think that Jesus heals you. But he might tell you, just wait. You, you pause and you get a divine healing that didn't require a doctor or anyone else. I've seen them both. I'm just glad that Jesus is not only taking care of my mortal body while I'm mortally running around, 
but I also am glad that he's going to come and, and, and resuscitate me from, from the dust of the earth. If I'm not here when he returns, he will cause you and I that are in Christ to rise again and, and, and uh, have a, an, an ascension body, a resurrection body, and we'll never die. Number five, you're obligated to God in verse 12, but not to the sinful nature. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it's not to the sinful nature to live according to it. Watch this. If you're still practicing sin, it's on your own. Well, brother, would you just pray for me? I believe El Diablo is making me do all these bad things. El Diablo is like, <clears throat> did you know what, what unclean spirit means? It's like when your little child expels gas. Do you run into the bathroom and, 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 and move in fear? No. You just say, wow, that was a dirty wind. That's what unclean spirit means, dirty wind. Unclean pneuma, unclean wind. The word spirit is pneuma. So when I think of, 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 of El Diablo, I don't think any believer should be in a mortal struggle against the devil. Why? What, what in your will area aren't you surrendering to God? Like, like if I'm totally maxed out on porno, you know, I may think, wow, it's a big demon. No, it's a big addiction. I mean, it's not like the devil has to create massive amounts of porno to keep someone hooked. It's just circulating. It's, it's kind of like, like, like I walked by the wine, uh, the wine uh, section, and I've never had bottles of wine leap up into our cart. El Diablo put me here, drink me. I grew up in Ashland. Man, everybody had patchouli oil on, thinking that, that that would mask that. That was the clear sign to the doper. You smell like patchouli oil you are carrying. But I, I, I didn't grow up thinking I had to smoke dope. You see, where does sin come from? James said it comes from out of you. Out of that sinful nature that we won't put to death. We're not under obligation to live under the flesh. Not under obligation to try to bring your own sacrifices. You don't have to go kill lambs, goats, pigeons. You don't have to do a ton of stuff, but you have to walk with God. You've got to become a family member. Now we come back in verse 13 to the snapshot, or excuse me, to a repeat of the crossroads of the mindset. Paul gives us conclusions here. The sinful nature eventuates in death. The, being led by the Spirit and putting to death the misdeeds of the body leads to life. Wow. You know, there are people that say, do you believe, you know, the, the Bible was completely translated accurately? And I say, it doesn't matter to me because all the themes are repeated repeatedly. All the themes... I set before you life and death. Choose life that you may live. Life and death, it's there from Genesis to Revelation. God being your righteousness, it's there from Genesis to Revelation. The need to get a control of yourself and not just follow your lust and believe that grace is some kind of a penicillin shot so an immoral person won't die of syphilis. There's something about you need to set your sail for the kingdom and with faith and patience, inherit the promises of God. Don't be sluggish, but imitate those who faith and patience. And those that walk righteous are going to tend to honor and glory. I don't want to be one of those snap and grab Christians. Well, I'm just pretty living carnal, but every once in a while, I'm, sorry, Jesus. Sorry, Lord. I want to get a grip on it. Say, so it's time to. Choke out <laughs> this, this mindset of, of the enemy. And then finally, the snapshot of what a son of God is. The son of God, which is what we've been given through the new birth. You were born as huios, a child of God. You will grow up to be a technon, a son of God, if you stay in the game. Fully adopted into the family.
A lot of people think that, that you're automatically a son. You're not a son unless you go through the training. You're a child. How many of you know we need sons of God to manifest? We don't need just people who should be sons by now remaining as children. And it comes through cooperation. But a sign of the sons of God is they are led by the Spirit of God. What does that mean? That means they can receive mystical guidance. God can speak to them. But it also means that they have the sense to know that the scripture was given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, teaching, instruction, and righteousness. That the man of God may be thoroughly furnished or equipped. So when I, want, when I want to touch base with the Holy Spirit, I don't try to get myself in a mystical mood. I just read the Bible and out of it comes all of that. I had a, had a Jewish sales guy stop by, an awning uh, guy, and, and it was a beautiful time. It was one of those spontaneous things, you know. We thought a homeless guy was knocking on our door, and it's a guy trying to communicate with us, and I step out, and I, 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 I could discern very quickly he was Jewish, and I asked him, I said, are you Goy? He said, no, I, he said, I haven't heard that for years. He said, I'm from Brooklyn. No, I'm, I'm, I'm Jewish. It ended up that we talked until he was asking me how I was born again. He was asking me how I received my call into the ministry. He was asking questions, and time after time it came, God spoke to me, God spoke to me, God spoke to me. I loved this guy. We we're like instant besties. He's not my bae. But anyway, <laughs> I have to get interpretation from the kids. But think about it. I love when God speaks to people. But I'll tell you what, some people won't hear God whisper because they won't, they won't, they will not respect what was written. If, if you disregard what's written clearly, do you think the Bible said the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him? I believe one of the keys that happened in my life was when I got born again and I shared this with him. In a moment's time, I was shocked into the kingdom of God. I went from being a church kid to where I was inflamed. And I walked to school the next day. And I was so radically changed that my, my classmates from my sophomore to senior year, they nicknamed me preacher. And God spoke to me at a private place and told me, the plan he had for me to stay another year in the valley and then he was going to lead me and he did. And when he led me to Kim, he spoke to me. He said, I want you to go to the Bay Area for two weeks. I love the voice of God. But I want to tell you something. You have to be in the written to hear the secret thing. Don't, don't try to substitute it. You need them both. But one comes before the other. Number two, we receive the spirit of sonship by, by which we're able to cry, Daddy, Father. I can get with people from all over the world, and I can tell those that have made God their dad. There's, there's just a commonality about it. The spirit, third thing is the spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. How many of you feel saved? Do you feel like a Christian? That's beautiful. A third of us, that's so powerful. <laughs> I feel like God's accepted me. Do you know some faiths don't have an assurance? Well, I hope I'm, I hope I'm good enough. No, when, when you're born of God, you feel. You feel accepted. You feel that witness within you. Number four, we're heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may share in his glory. I think that growing on to be an adopted son of the Lord, we have to share in the suffering, which means what? I'm not running from battle. I'm holding the high ground that you told me to hold, Lord. I'm hoping there's reinforcements, but it doesn't matter. Kim, and my assignment was to establish the kingdom of God in Medford. And you never told us we had an off button or a time we could quit. So I think we're supposed to be faithful unto death. Right? That's, that's so powerful when, when, when we understand that if we will share in that suffering, 
Where does suffering come from? People that want to pull you back. They'll mock you. They'll call you, you know, you're religious, you're a goody two-shoes, you think you're better than us, you're this, you're that. You're too harsh. Joy standards are too high. We've had a lot of suffering following Jesus. But if we want to be a co-heir with Christ and not just a child that's permitted to come in, saved so as by fire, if I want a full inheritance with Christ, I better walk like him and suffer like he did. So that means the more vacations you take from your obedience, the less chance that you'll reach your destiny as a co-heir of Christ. Got to have it. Anyway, um, I'm going to finish here by just some conclusions. Number one, you're free to overcome anything sinful. You're free to overcome. You're, you're free. Every, every debt that you or your family line has incurred against heaven... You might have had a great grandma back in the swamps of, of Louisiana that, that put a hex on your whole family line. You don't have to be responsible for that anymore. You say all debt has been paid by the blood of Jesus. Any, any, any uh, bitter root curses put on me, any covenants that were put on our family line, they're done, over, pay, P-A in full, paid in full by the blood of Jesus Christ. You're free to overcome anything sinful. Why is that good? Because the mind of sinful man is death. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it. And those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. So it's in my vested interest and yours, put away the deeds of the flesh. Put sin out of your life. Drain that swamp. Number two, the payment has been made by Christ's blood and the sending of the Holy Spirit. Number three, you determine. Not Aunt Ella, not your cousin Leroy. You, you. That means personal. I'm making this personal. You, you choose your mindset. Well, you know, I'd serve the Lord, but my wife doesn't want to walk with God. Walk with God. Well, she might leave me. Hello. Sorry. And I do mean sorry. But I'll tell you what, there's one, one meeting I don't want to have a rejection at, and that's when I go before God to give account of my life. And he said, you stopped your destiny because you thought your wife would leave you. She wouldn't have. She actually would have followed you. Sometimes you've got to be a stand-up person and not count the cost. Except that this is what God wants you to do. You determine the mindset. You set the mind on the spirit or you set it on the flesh. Brother, pray for me. The devil's been after me all week. Bless his holy name. The devil doesn't have a holy name. We're not going to bless his unholy name. And why, why are you feasting on what the devil's been saying? When you've got all of the Bible, you've got all kinds of small groups to be a part of. You can pray in tongues. You can pray in the Spirit. You can sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. You can watch Tasha Cobb on YouTube. That's what Johnny's taught me. <laughs> You're no un uh, under no obligation to the flesh. Number four and number five, you're made to be an heir of God and co-heir of Christ. I told you I was going to finish a story it's about three, three Mikes. Two of them, their brothers, Rick and, 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 and Glenn, were in my grade. And Rick had a, a brother named Mike, uh, younger, one grade below me in Ashland. And Rick, Rick and Glenn both had a brother named Mike. And oh, the, the third kid's name was Mark. These kids were just good-looking kids from Ashland. They weren't they weren't necessarily even disruptive in school, but they just consumed the course of the world. And so they started partying and just doing what you do when you're unregenerate. Your, your sinful mind is going to take you to death. Some people are living death, but they're still alive and there's still hope for them to come to Jesus. But one Mike, Glenn's younger brother, 
They found him swell twice his size from an overdose, overdose of dope up at the top of Lithia Park. And the other Mike, Rick's younger brother, half his head got sheared off in a motorcycle accident in, in, near Bard's Inn in Ashland against a concrete culvert there. And Mark, he ended up, uh, he might still be alive, but just drunkenness, drugs, was pursued by an Ashland cop, and the, the cop should have pulled off, but he was chasing him right through talent, and he T-boned an older lady who happened to be my dad's carpenter's mother and killed her. Death, death, death. I'm going to tell you something. If you want a bad afternoon, I want you to come in my office and you talk to me why we need to lower our standards. And you talk to me how that we're not in a world of warfare. Those were three handsome, fun, nice guys. So what was my thought? Oh God, in those last three years of high school, I don't recall having the opportunity to shine the light. We need all of you, not just elders and leaders. They need to walk holy, but we're just like some of the sheep. We need to be one unit of armed men and women walking in the Spirit of God so that nobody gets a view that by following us, it's all compromised city. It'll, all roads lead to the same place. No, all roads lead to hell except one, is what the Bible said. We need to walk the straight and narrow. We need to be an example. We need to take care of our headroom. Put my mind, my phrenos, not just my spirit, my mind needs to be set on the things of the spirit. Come on now. Today's sermon, I went long, but I think that it's important what I'm teaching. Could we stand up? One thing I don't want you doing as a takeaway, you don't have to fear that pastor's threatening, that three of your friends are going to die. I'm giving an example from reality, from my world, from my memories. And we become subject to the things we've seen. And they will change us sometimes and hopefully for the better. I regret every time I've ever disobeyed God. I regret the times that I've chosen the mindset that was hostile. Predominantly as a believer, you have the spirit working within you to set your mind on the good. But I've watched people get really casual and end up casual tees. The Bible tells us, be vigilant, be watchful. Your enemy walks about as a roaring lion. That we're to not forsake the gathering of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but we're to intensify fellowship and encouragement more as the day approaches, the day of the Lord. I want to tell you something. I love you too much. If you become a casualty, I'll cry. I'll carry your body out. But I'm kind of a seal, a Navy seal inside. And I like inflicting damage on the enemy and coming home with all of us rejoicing as we run through the jungle happy because we've executed our duties and we all survived. The biggest battle is in your own mind. It's setting your mind daily on the Lord. And in so doing, you can save yourself and those that hear you. Right now, I'd like to give an opportunity to come to Jesus. Week after week, we let people know about what it means to come to the Lord. There's not a bunch of heavy lifting that you can do to qualify to be a born-again Christian. One, you have to feel a conviction that God wants me. He wants me. And he's real. And I feel that funky feeling that says, I'm still an outsider. 
I'm not born of God yet. Man, as this guy's talking, I feel like, man, half of everything I want is bad. Maybe two thirds, maybe all of it. But God wants you to make you a child. He wants to free you from sin. He wants to pay for your sins. And he wants to take you by the hand and walk with you. So you can learn to walk like him. This is the dad that will never abandon you. This is the dad that has loved you more than life itself. He's the one that weekly we see people come to joy and give their life to God. I've never had anybody walk in and say, you know, I, I responded and I gave my heart to Jesus and, you know, I'm really, uh, you know, I want money back. I've never had anybody tell me when they became born of God that it was a bum deal. But I've had many people come with tears. Pastor Steve, if I could have heard you 20 years ago, I wouldn't have had to take the trail of tears. I wouldn't have had to take the time of suffering and violating myself and hurting others in the process. That's why I love to give an opportunity to get saved. It's because deep inside, I wish I could get saved every week. I wish I could just say, God, save me again. But he goes, no, just grow up. You're saved. But I'd like you to bow your, your head and close your eyes. If you're here today and say, Pastor, as you're preaching, I realize that, man, God's thinking is alien to me. And I want to be a part of the family of God. Tengo las ganas para entrar en la familia de Dios. Yo soy un pecador. Y necesito uno cambiar de mi corazón. Lord, I acknowledge I'm a sinner. And I need a change of heart. Thank you, Lord. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I'm in, just raise your hand. I, I'd like to just get an acknowledgement that you want to join God because he's joined you. Every one of you that came in this place and said, man, I need a new start. Don't let the devil dupe you. Well, you know, you can always do this later. That's exactly what he wants. He wants you to put it off to later. But today is the day of salvation. Come on now, real quickly. You're here. You want to join God? I see a hand here. Okay. Any other hands? Come on now. I see a hand here. Come on, you guys. I'm so proud of you. Look, there's hands going up now. I see about four or five now. Yep. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to tell you guys, you guys raise your hand. Trust me, man. There's a lot of things I'm ashamed of in my life, but serving God's not one of them. <laughs> my choice. We're going to pray a prayer. Just pray this with me. And then uh, uh, Drew is going to give announcements and he'll tell you how to follow up on what your commitment is. How many of you say it's great to see people come to Jesus? <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Pray this with me. Repeat this with me. Dear Father, I thank you that I'm not only permitted to be a child of God, but I'm desired. You desired to take sin out of my life, to make me a child of God that will grow up to be a full son with inheritance with Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for calling me. I don't defend my actions. I don't defend the hostile mindset I've had. But I need to be made new. You said, Lord, if I would call on your name, I would be saved. I'm calling on your name today, Lord. Save me. You also said, if I would call on your name, I would not be ashamed. Take away the shame. Those shameful things that I've done in my body and in my thoughts. Make me new on the inside. If you'll be my God, I'll be your servant. If you'll be my father, I'll be your child. I receive you today, dear father. In Jesus' name, amen.
if you raised your hand, and even if you didn't raise your hand, but you prayed that prayer and made the decision to follow God, we want to help you in this journey of newness of life. So we have some decision cards that are in the pew in front of you. If you wouldn't mind filling out one of those and you can turn it in in the Connect Center on your way out, you can bring it up and give it to someone on the prayer team um, here at the altar. Or you can text decision to the number on the screen. And like I said, we want to journey with you in this newness of life. You cannot be a Christian on your own. And so we simply want to come beside you and help you walk out the next steps for that. As we wrap up the service, I just want to remind you, this week is the last week of our Connect Group semester. It's a little bittersweet, but don't worry. The next Connect Group semester is going to start before you know it. And we want to remind you, a lot of the groups are having parties. And if not, it's guaranteed to be a good time no matter what. So make sure you don't miss the last Connect Group this week. Um, Growth Track is your next best step. So if you haven't joined Growth Track, next Sunday is going to be week two. There's refreshments provided, and it's happening during the second service. So make sure you come check that out. Uh, Believe it or not, next Sunday is Mother's Day. Wow. So make sure you come and join us. Bring your mother if she's not here. Honor your mother. Come join us for our Mother's Day service. It's going to be an incredible time. And then last, if you'd like prayer, we're going to have a prayer team down here at the altar to pray with you. We want to pray and believe for whatever you're going through, dealing with. So make sure you come for that. Um, Come up here for prayer. And uh, at this time, if you have to go, you're dismissed to leave. If you have kids, please go straight to their cast classes and pick them up, Um, but the team is going to lead us in a time of worship, and um, you're welcome to stay and worship for a little bit longer. God bless you. We love you so much, and we'll see you next time.